In a previous episode of the Knife and Fork Show, we talked about one of the first two big regulations to come out of the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act on January 4th, the 547-page Produce Safety Standards Proposal. But that was the little brother to the bigger proposal that was released by FDA on the same day, the 680-page Preventive Controls Proposal. So when did the FDA hire Tolstoy as one of its regulatory writers? Here to break down what's in this massive proposal in just 10 minutes or less are two top food regulatory experts from the Washington, D.C. area. From the firm of Hyman Phelps and McNamara, we have Ricardo Carvajal. And returning from the firm of Morgan Lewis Bacchius, we have Tony Pavel. You might remember Tony from one of our previous episodes when we talked about food additives. He has 11 years of experience in the food regulatory arena. Ricardo has been in this equally long and, in fact, worked roughly six years at FDA as Associate Chief Counsel in the FDA's Office of Chief Counsel. Gentlemen, let's just talk about this massive regulation. What are the biggest changes coming from it? What are, what are, we, what are we looking at? Well, <laughs> where to start? <laughs> That's the biggest change, where to start. The biggest change is a move from a, a, a relatively basic set of good manufacturing practices to the requirement for much larger uh, preventive controls, which are much closer, in fact, well, go beyond in some instances, has HACCP programs that you've seen on the seafood side and the meat and poultry side. So we're, it's a much more comprehensive plan that uh, adds a tremendous amount of both sort of paperwork and planning for the industry. Right, and, and I th so I think it's the culmination of everything that FDA has been hammering, uh, hammering away at for the last couple of years. We need to turn this around from reaction to prevention. And, uh, and the, the name of the rule says it all. It essentially now puts together what was in Part 110, the GMPs, as the prerequisite now for preventive controls. Um, and you see all the elements that, that you're used to seeing if you're familiar with seafood HACCP or juice HACCP or, or uh, on the USDA side HACCP there as well. And you'll see, and in in FDA keeps repeating this too in, in line with the prevention, is they keep saying, look, food safety is primarily industry's responsibility. We're here to enforce and to, gu you know, to guide, but they're really, you know, you, you see this in, in the proposed rule and when you see in officials from the agency talking, primary responsibility belongs to the industry and that's what this really does. It, it puts in a, a set of requirements uh, or framework to set up that preventive program. Are there some specific, uh, specific examples of uh, elements of this rule that uh, the industry will have to implement? I recall something about uh, a person being held accountable or responsible and being uh, trained on, on uh, food safety issues? Well, I think you think, are you thinking of the, the, the qualified individual requirement? Yes. And that's actually, you know, uh, that's raised a, a lot of questions with the industry and what, where that ties in. So you have to have, you need to have a food safety plan uh, for your business, for your food business. And the way the, the rule is, the proposed rule is written, uh, you need to have a qualified individual who designs, implements, and, and takes care of that plan for you. And there's a couple of factors going on there. Part of the issue is, you know, a lot of industry on, on, the, on the FDA side, they have some level of a HACCP or, or what had traditionally been referred to as a HACCP program in place from sort of mid-level and even smaller in companies on up. And you always have, you know, either your director of quality assurance, um, uh, the, the plant manager, et cetera. Now, what the qualified individual does, FDA is going to have a model curriculum which they're working on with the Illinois Institute of Technology. And that will set forth sort of the minimum, st what they see as the minimum qualifications for this person. However, there is also flexibility in that it can be by, you know, training and experience as well. So a lot of industries, you know, are, is waiting to see how this, uh, this initial curriculum comes out. And that will ultimately end up sort of setting, sort of setting the minimum requirements or setting the bar for that right. qualified individual. Now that's an example of something the industry probably can adapt to pretty quickly. There's something similar already there. Uh, I, I would, I, I think that there's probably more concern over that right now than there probably needs to be. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so what are some of the changes that the industry is looking at that may not be so easy to adapt to? Um, I, what caught my eye was the appendix. Um, so the, it, in, in the appendix, FDA uh, talks about the value of uh, finished product testing, of environmental monitoring, of supplier verification, and how valuable all those things are to the prevention of, of contamination and foodborne illness. Um, why it was relegated to an appendix and not actually incorporated into the codified, you know, we could play a guessing game about that. But at the end of the day, the fact that it made it into the appendix means that it could make it into the final rule, that we could see codified that sets out requirements, binding requirements for each of those areas. So everybody's on notice that it's in there, uh, and I hope that everybody will comment on it because the impact of that would be highly significant, not only on the front end, but on the back end. If you're doing all that testing, you're going to get results. What are you going to do with those results? Right. That's where recalls come from. That's where reportable food incidents come from. A lot of times, is testing. And both, you know, both as we were talking before, both the environmental testing. There's a lot of variables, both in the test method. Where do you do that testing? Also, the interest, uh, the, the final product testing is interesting because under sort of traditional HACCP uh, uh, preventive controls uh, model programs. The finished product testing is a piece that's there, but it shouldn't be the most, it, it, it's not the critical piece. If your program is working, the finished product testing, um, it, it, if you don't want to test everything because then it, it's sort of negating some of the effort you've put in on the front end. And if you're testing random samples, how many samples do you need to test? So the idea behind traditional concepts of HACCP is that if your program isn't good, is well constructed and addresses your hazards and puts in preve appropriate preventive controls. That the final product testing is, it's nice, but it it, it shouldn't be a linchpin. Okay, well, we're running out of time, and there's definitely two questions I have to ask. One is, what about the timing of this rule? I mean, when will we see a final rule? When will it be implemented? <laughs> what, should um, I, what, I should, what should I bet on in Vegas? <laughs> Boy, I, I would not. Those are those are some long odds. You're 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 picking, you know, black number thirteen at the roulette table. Um, look, you know, we can. If you look at when the sort of has of the the U.S. the FSIS mega reg came in, that took about four years to go from proposed to final. Then yeah. on the FDA right. side, seafood has up, I think, was uh, two years from proposed to final, and then you know more time for implementation. And you know, FDA has been doing. Considering the amount of work that was legislated to FDA, they've done a pretty good job both managing it and getting that work done. But if you look, you know, this proposed rule was a couple of years late. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and then of course there's there's different time implementation time frames depending on the size of the company. But I could see this stretching out. I got to ask one more question: Could we see elements of this rule? leak into FDA enforcement in advance of a final rule? I think they're already there. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if you have the, the rule writ large, which now incorporates GMPs, sure. Um, on the preventive control side, uh, specific elements, I think that would be tricky. To the extent that, that the obligations captured in those elements can be read into the statutory provisions that underlie it. Possibly, but uh, there's going to be a lot of sensitivity, you know, to that issue now that FDA has announced that it intends to exercise discretion. I, I think so. that you know they'll have difficulty saying that you need to have a fully formed food safety program, but at the same time, if if you have a, a food safety risk that's that, that's cropped up, and you're at the point where they're looking at at yanking your registration, I, I could see you not getting back to market until you're pretty close to what's been outlined in that rule and. You know, if you look at some of the warning letters already, um, and it, the, the, the clearest one is actually the, the, that I would draw the distinction to is on the on the produce rule. And if you look at the last big warning letter and the issues that they cite in that warning letter, you can line them up with the provisions in the produce so rule. So almost like the language came out of the rule itself. I think there's an argument to be made there. All right. Well, 680 pages. We got 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more. I don't think we can cover it all, but you guys did a great job. So, that's it. I don't want to interrupt any more of the time that Ricardo Carvajal and Tony Pavel have for reading FISMA regulations, because I know that's what they'd rather be doing right now. Thanks to both of them for appearing on the Knife and Fork Show. Come back next time when we bring another food regulatory personality in the studio. Mm -hmm.